my honor uh, to introduce Director Wente from the Ohio Department of Children and Youth. Uh, there is a lot of changes that are happening at the state level, and so we are so happy to be joined by them to kind of explain how some of these pieces are going to be working going forward. Thanks, Judith. Well, thank you guys for some time today. I know I have to the extreme pleasure of following Chancellor Duffy this morning. I told him, like, don't set the bar too high. I'm like, it's a Friday, it's raining. He's like, they're such a nice group. So I was like, okay, you you, you got the full effect. The, the secret's out. This is a good group to come talk to. So uh, thank you for being kind to him, and hopefully you carry that through till lunch. No, I'm kidding. Um, as Judith said, my name is Kara. I have the extreme pleasure of being the director for the Department of Children and Youth. Uh, the governor did create the new department in the last budget. Uh, we were actually just discussing that it was last October when all of the team members were notified. They got their new email addresses. Um, we had our first all team meeting. So although we were created over a year ago, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of time for things to come to fruition. So how many of you are familiar with the new department? Okay, so you at least know our name and a little bit about what we do. So I'm going to give you a, a bit of an overview if I can figure out how to um, work the slides. I'm going to share a little bit about what we've done so far, what we're looking to do this year, and then uh, tee up what we're hoping to accomplish in the next two years and three months with Governor DeWine and his leadership. So for those of you who have had the opportunity to hear about the new department, hopefully this slide looks familiar to you. What we are really focused on at the new department is, and I'm gonna to continue to say new for a while, I'm buying myself some time, just so you know, um, transparency and accountability are key. When we talk about kids, when we talk about money, when we talk about investments, one of the pieces that's really hard is everyone wants to know, well, what do I get for it? If I invest all this money, because our programs are expensive, what do I get in return? And sometimes we're not great at telling our story in that space. So we're really trying to be transparent, which also creates accountability when you start to share that data. Not just with how much money are we spending, how many kids are we serving, but what are we seeing change and happen differently in that child and in that family? Um, when we talk about focus and prioritization, a lot of people think we're a birth to five or birth to eight agency. We are not, we are birth to 21. If you're not familiar with the programs we have, uh, as soon as Children's Services enters your portfolio, your age range expands. And when we talk about Children's Services, we really look at, that's the end goal. How many of our systems failed that child if that's where their family ended up? And we're starting to look at what, what can we do from the data perspective to try to find those families before they hit that point. And part of the reason bringing this new department was so important was not just so we would talk about the programs across the system, but also for that data accountability um, that sometimes we don't get when we're in, in under different umbrellas. And then last but not least, everyone that works at the local um, level often says, well, if you're changing at the state, does that mean we're gonna have to change at our local level? And the answer is no. We knew when the governor came to us, he's like, in the first four years, I created the, you know, the Children's Initiatives Office, I put more money in, I created focus, we talked about kids, we made them the priority, they are our story, they are our future. He was clear. But our outcomes weren't following. And we know outcomes lag, but his question, his concern was, what more can we do to really make sure that our services and supports and what we're thinking we're paying for, because we all talk, especially with my higher education friends, evidence-based practice, stati statistical significance. We care about those things. What does it mean? And are we getting it? If we're not, why not? Because sometimes what we're seeing is we can make a family eligible, but if they can't actually get there, because we provided transportation, but we didn't provide a car seat, we didn't have childcare. Those are things we have to work through. And that's what we've been charged with doing. We can talk about our goals. Our goals at the bottom, um, we continue to refine, but what are gonna be overarching is we want more children to thrive and reach their first birthday. One of the pieces and parts that I hope you're sitting here thinking about today is, well, infant, I hope what you're not doing is saying infant mortality, infant vitality, maternal health, they're not my thing. I'm in, I'm in higher education. I'm in childcare. We all have a part of this. And that's been part of the problem too. We've left our infant vitality friends sometimes alone saying, you do your part. Well, they don't have all the connections and all the relationships. So it's really trying to figure out how can we leverage our system differently? 
and you all are definitely a part of that. When we talk about our professionals, you'll see a slide at the end that shows that we have about 80,000 professionals that we engage with in our licensed programs. Their average age is generally between, I think, 29 and 32, predominantly African-American. Many of them have children, and they're the exact people that we should be sharing our information with, and they have networks that they should be sharing their information with, but we haven't leveraged them in that way. So it's really looking at how can we do things different? How can we better come together, not to create more services and supports? Sure, some of that's true, but how can we really build from the relationships we each have to better connect? We can talk about the pandemic. We can say the pandemic is the reason that we lost some of that. I don't know that we were ever really good at it, but the pandemic certainly didn't help. And that's something that we're really trying to get back to. We met with about 270 families over the last year, really intentionally. We had 10 sessions. We went to their communities. They have lived experience with our system. And we said, what do you want us to know or what would help you most? And inevitably, no matter what scenario, what lived experience they had, what their economic climate was like, their comment was, one, listen to us because we know what we need. And two, we need someone to talk to that will listen. We don't have a network. We don't have someone to call. If we did, we would do that. So how do you start building that network? So as we transition into talking about, you know, where are we starting from? Uh, the initial conversations around the new department were super interesting because everyone's like, well, how do you define success? And what we came back with is we have to talk about where we're at today. How many children are we serving? How does that compare to our population? Why do we have more referrals in early intervention than in home visiting or vice versa? And why are we losing those kids and should they be cross referred? That's happening really well in some communities. It's not happening at all in others. Why is that? Is it because the families don't need both? Is it because they don't know about each other? Is it a concern? You know, this data all being on one page looks maybe a little bit overwhelming, but what it also shows you is where we're starting from. How many kids do we have? What does the poverty level look like? How many babies did we lose? And this is from 21. We now have more up-to-date data. But I think all of us can sit here and say, we should, in Ohio, not lose 912 babies in a year. We are a resource community. We want to be there for our neighbors. How do we play a part in that? This data being on one page starts to show where did our system maybe have a barrier that we didn't intend it to. So really, with all good data, all you do is ask more questions. But this is our baseline. This is where we started from. Then we said, what can we do immediately over this last year to impact where we saw those gaps? So, you know, I told you we went out and we met with families. They said, listen to us. We're working to hire parent ambassadors. We have some resource and referral agencies in the room. They are helping us do that. Those, aren't, those uh, parent ambassadors are actually being held at the local level so they can be a part of the community that they can know where the resources are. Because as nice as I am, I think, people don't always wanna to talk to someone from the government. I understand that. So these are non-government people that are gonna be having these conversations. They're gonna be in the communities that they're working in, they're living there. So they know what's working, what's not, who the matriarch of the community is gonna be, who people are gonna to listen to. That's really important. I don't wanna recreate that. I want to lean into where the community is. When we start to go over this little half circle here, you see developmental screening and central intake. We all talk about home visiting and early intervention and people that have their families involved really like the service. You never really hear a lot of people complaining about the service when they're in. And they really appreciated central intake right beginning where they had one place to go and get that referral. And that was great if you had a kid between birth to three. But if that kid was three or four or five and not in school, once you're in the district, you know that they're gonna provide you resources, you know who you're gonna ask. Even if they're not bringing the resources to you, you know you have someone to go to. But what do you do in that gap? So we said, okay, let's, let's take a step back. How do we fill that gap? So we expanded our central intake, birth to five. That started in July. And I just wanna say for government to come up with this, you know, since last October, and it was implemented in July, that's pretty fast, right? I mean, we're gonna 
take our wins where we get them. <laughs> and what we also did is expand the ages and stages questionnaire. I know I don't have to explain that to all of you. You guys know the value of the ASQ. You know the value of having a standardized assessment that a parent can fill out at home and feel like they're not identifying their kid for something being wrong with them, but they're asking questions, the right questions. And so we expanded that ASQ so it can be done. They can go online, they can fill it out. And then what happens? That ASQ goes to central intake. And now that we've expanded it from birth to three to birth to five, they can help us make those referrals. What we're trying to do is streamline the system of support that we have. We talk a lot about the continuum of care. What we also found, what we started to map it out is, well, we got some real clear gaps. So when we start to move over to expansions for services, three to five year olds, we said, well, what happens to those kids? You know, early intervention is really focused on development and preschool special education is really focused on education. What happens when they still have a developmental need, but it's not really impairing their education? And that happens to almost 2,000 kids a year. What do we do? We don't have resources for them unless their local community came up with them. So we created a pilot to fill that gap to say, okay, let's start with a pilot to figure out how we navigate it. You know what we found out? We create some of our own restrictions. Well, if they're over the age of three, early intervention can no longer share their data with preschool special education, and preschool special education can't share it. So we had to work through that. That's why you do a pilot. But what we also found is the kids that really benefited from that service saw the need met. What does that do? It makes them more ready to enter kindergarten in a level playing field. Those are the things we've tried to identify over the last year. And when we talk about data sharing, you heard me mention that earlier. Um, those of you in higher education or those of you in a school district, uh, you all may have it harder than us to share data. But it's not easy at any level. But what we have found is now that these programs are in one place, the best example that I can give is the fact that we knew we had some early, care, early childhood education slots available. About end of January, we're like, wait, we have slots available and we have a few thousand kids in our children's service custody, ages three and four that weren't getting care. They're in a kinship placement. That grandmother, aunt, uncle didn't expect to have that child. They're eligible for ECE. How do we connect them? Now, is the number as high as we would have liked? No, but 150 kids benefited from us sharing that data and making those connections. That's 150 kids that were getting two and a half hours a day of quality education that wouldn't have had we not be, been able to, to match that data. Well, that's what we have to do more of. I will tell you that at some point while I am sitting in this seat, what the goal is, is that if I have all this data and I know my kids in children's service custody, why am I not backing it up to see what system knew about them before that? Because when we talk about prevention and we talk about intervention, that may be the place for us to reach them. Not when they're calling because you're a mandated reporter and you feel like there's a concern in that family. That's not when we want to reach them. We want to reach them earlier. So what is that natural point? We have data now that we can get there. That means we can move the needle. We can move outcomes. And, you know, I, I just had the opportunity to spend some time with Governor DeWine over the last few days and Chancellor Duffy, and we had a lot of conversations around the fact that it's not all about more money and more services. Sometimes it's leveraging the money and the services we have differently. And I hope that's what you're going to continue to see from us. So that was 24. First year running, standing up. This year still running, standing up. But what else are we doing? So I like slides with a lot of words. So let me apologize for that up front. <laughs> and the eye test in the back, we know you cannot read this. <laughs> you will get a copy of the slide deck. But what I hope you see, and because you're my education friends, um, you probably like logic models as much as I do because they're clear, they hold you accountable, all those good things. So you see that we have our priorities. We have our program areas. We color coded, which I also love to go to our goals and said, what programming do we have this year that we can streamline, we can focus, we can make sure it's gonna drive metrics. And then this short term goal area, what tangible metrics to build on that baseline can we actually move? We have lofty goals, right? But you have to set lofty goals. So increase the number of families served by home visiting by 10%. You also see numbers after our percentages. Fun fact with Governor DeWine, he likes both because he wants to know the number of people. He wants to know who's really getting that service, which is a great accountability metric for us. 
when we look at some of this, reduced turnover by 5% of administrators, lead teachers, and assistant teachers. Anybody have a guess on what our turnover rate was last year? 38%. You're close. She guessed 38. 40? 33. So when we talk about this, 5% seems like a lot. But since April, we started to see that turnover rate shift a little. And we can talk about a variety of reasons. We know that across the board, the labor force participation has stabilized a little bit. We know that we've increased base rates and we've seen the average wage go up a little bit. But 5% seems like it might be attainable. And then you can start looking at, well, what does that mean for kids? Well, that means 700 kids didn't have a new teacher this month. That means 555 kids didn't have a new teacher this month. And if you've recently dropped your child off at childcare, you know what that means to them. So we're trying to hold ourselves accountable to these metrics. There's lots in here. Um, we broke them down so you can actually read them. We included early childhood mental health, uh, the decreasing the number of kids in congregate care. What that means is our children's service kids. We have the lowest number of kids in our custody, our children's service custody since 2016. That's great news. It is still not where it needs to be. When you have 14,600 kids in our custody, that means we're still working to find families, foster families, adoptive families. We're working to reunify those families whenever we can. But it means we failed them because we missed the opportunity to stabilize them. So how do we do better there? We're also looking at increasing non-traditional care and care for children with special needs. Um, and obviously increasing access for infants and toddlers. You know in the early care and education space, no matter what role you sit in, families struggle to find care at times. We want to build capacity. We want to build the infrastructure. We want to lay the foundation. A lot of the work we're doing is trying to really look at how do we make it so we set the foundation for these programs so that they can be profitable, so that they can make it so that they can focus on actually serving the child rather than how am I gonna braid all these different funding sources to make ends meet. We're not there yet, but we're, that's why we're, you're seeing some changes and you're seeing us invest because we know that until you invest in that baseline, people don't have that certainty to increase wages. They don't have that certainty to do different investments that we need them to to be successful. So where are we going? The logic models for this state fiscal year we have another budget with Governor DeWine that we are all feverishly working on right now. And what we're looking at at the Department of Children and Youth is where do we want to end up? So our three big goals where all of our priorities are going to move to, first and foremost, reduce the infant mortality rate. And when you talk about things like 4.4 per thousand, I can ignore that. That doesn't have a face to it. But when I say we need to save more than 330 babies and you know we lost more than 900, but we are a, a state that has 88 counties. What is that, three per county? No, that's not how it breaks down, right? We have more in our metros. We have other areas that have concern, but we know where they're at. So how do we rally around those communities? When we look at the second one, you all hopefully see yourselves really actively engaged here because you're either training the professionals, you're supporting the professionals, you're building awareness for those families, improve kindergarten readiness to 60% from the 36% we're at today. We've never moved that fast. So why do we think this is at all attainable in the next two years and three months? Well, with the changes to step up to quality and providers moving in our bronze level, having to have a curriculum aligned with the early learning standards, aligned with the science of reading. Um, it's about 2,300 programs and about 43,000 kids that will now have different access to that type of curriculum. We also know that we're building an infrastructure. We're investing in base rates. We're, seeing, we're starting to see turnover mitigate, which means they're gonna have more consistency in the classroom. There are things that we know we've started to employ as a system that we're hoping we start to see the benefits of. And then last but not least, we want fewer children to enter our foster system. Not because our mandated reporters are not calling. We need them to call. We, need, we know there will always be families that need us. But when we look at our other state counterparts, we know that we can do better to reach those families earlier. And where do you all fit into this? If you're an educator, if you're training an educator, as I said earlier, 79,932 early childhood, 
childhood professionals. So when I talked to Chancellor Duffy about coming to meet with you all today, he's like, you know, Kara, do they just want to know about the work? I said, they want to know about the collaboration. They want to know how we see you all as a priority because we know that we can't be successful in any of those goals if these professionals aren't prepared. And if they don't have the support they need to be in that classroom and be there for those kids. What we also know about these professionals is about 80% of them have no formal education after high school. That doesn't mean they can't, just means they don't. So how do we create a career pathway? How do we create a model that for those that want to go get that credential, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, that they can? And you know, my, uh, my impression of all of this has changed sitting in this seat. When I was at JFS as the assistant director, I focused on early care and education in a very narrow lane. How do I make sure my money, my resources go to early care and education? And that's right, that's the starting point. But why do I care where they end up as long as they're still serving kids? What if they're going into behavioral health? What if they're going into psychology? What if they wanna go be a children's service caseworker, but they need a four year degree to do that? Why don't I support them while they're in this role and try to move them from one of those critical jobs they're in today, if that's what they want, into an in-demand job? And you all play a really critical role in that. But ultimately, first and foremost, we have to prepare them for the job they're in. And then we need to figure out where do they wanna go or how do we keep them helping these kids? So we're doing a lot of work on that. I know you all are having a lot of conversations around that. Clearly, we're having a lot of conversations with Chancellor Duffy and also uh, Director Dakin from the Department of Education and Workforce. Um, excited about that collaboration and what's to come. We're certainly trying to nail that down as we trudge forward to that 26-27 budget timeline. I think I have three minutes. I'd be happy to take a couple questions if anyone has any questions. We're not missing anything. Oh, yep. So quick question. Are there state grants that are specifically earmarked to help finance the professional development of these professionals that are already in the field and or perhaps new high school graduates that are seeking those from secondary credentials? So we already invest in teach scholarships and Power Ohio with wage retention. Um, so there, there are some, but again, what we're looking at is how do we expand that? Um, it's great if they're in early care and education and they know that's where they wanna go, but we also need early intervention specialists, we need home visitors, and we have addition, we have separate programs on the children's service side. So we have a program called the University Partnership Program, but you already have to be in college to participate in that. We have um, a fellowship program that you already have to have a degree for, but you can move forward. Or, I'm sorry, you don't have to have a degree, but you have to be going for a great degree. What we're trying to figure out is how do we smooth that out? So that yes, to your, to your question, yes, there are some, but there are not as many as there should be. And there are not enough that really cover that continuum to support our professionals in the way that probably best suits their needs. So we have some work to do on that side. But there are some that they could leverage from Teach and Power Ohio, and I would suggest you talk to Judith, and she will get you all the information that um, you need. Any other questions? I just wanna say thank you. You all have tough jobs. It's not an easy time to be in early care and education. I think it's constantly changing. Um, we, I think for the first time ever as we prepare for the budget, are hearing support across the board for early care and education. People are recognizing for all the pandemic did that we don't wanna talk about. Early care and education really came to the top of the list on where people saw a need for their community, for their employers and for their families. So I'll take that as one little piece of silver lining that we never wanna relive, but we'll take away as a positive. Thank you.